so folks, I have old Donnie being humiliated in two different yet equally hilarious ways. One of which we cover often, which is him getting roundly mocked and absolutely smacked around in the media as his arguments fail and as it becomes very clear that he is not ready for the election. Like this argument that Trump is ready and raring to go is absurd because he's largely been distancing himself from any critical media. And when it actually comes down to it and the election hits, he is not going to be ready when Joe Biden absolutely crushes him like he did on the debate stage four years ago now, almost four years ago. Now, it gets even worse for Trump because outside his own home, Regular Americans and progressive groups and even some anti-Trump Republican groups have been mocking him with billboards that he cannot miss. We've covered stories like... So we have this debate that Dana and I will be moderating uh, coming up. And, and um, Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis have both qualified for the stage. As of now, the only other person that is qualified in terms of the, the requirements is, is Donald Trump. But he has said he's not going to attend. Haley put out a statement today that says, with only three candidates qualifying... It's time for Donald Trump to show up. As the debate stage continues to shrink, it's getting harder for Donald Trump to hide. And a DeSantis spokesperson posted on Twitter, now known as X, we understand Donald Trump is scared to get on the stage because he'd have to finally explain why he didn't build the wall, added nearly $8 trillion to the debt, and turned the country over to Fauci. But even Gavin Newsom had the courage to stand on the stage to debate his own failed record against Ron DeSantis. Do you think it still at this point is a good strategy for Donald Trump to skip these debates. I mean, now this is the first one that's going to be this small. I can understand his not going to like one where there's like 30 people, but sure. DeSantis and Haley are both credible candidates. He should be there, shouldn't so he? So we're, we're in football playoff season right now. And that's the way I used to hear voters talk about this a couple of months ago, that it was a kind of okay for Donald Trump to sit out the quarterfinals, maybe even the semifinals, but we've reached the final round. I was less than two weeks away. And so if it was ever going to hurt Donald Trump, missing this debate on the 10th may be the one, but I'm still skeptical that him doing anything but playing a very safe strategy, just get through Iowa, have the blowout that he's expecting. That's probably the safer strategy. But if it was ever going to hurt him, this is when it would hurt him. But you know what? If you're Donald Trump, you have there's no reason to show up. So bad for CNN and the American public, although he's going to be on Fox. But, you know, for, from his perspective, his campaign has done so much also behind the scenes to make sure that they can shore up this nomination by March you know, changing the rules in California, some of the things they're doing with the RNC. Again, he doesn't have to show up, A, because he's got the support and the numbers. B, they're working behind the scenes to rig, to use his term, the rules. So why show up when you can just keep doing what you're doing? I mean, there's lots of there's lots of answers I could give you. <laughs> yes. One is it shows respect for the American people and Republican voters. Right. I mean, like I'm willing to take some tough questions. He's not going to face any tough questions but going before Fox. No. I mean, I, mean you know. I agree with you. I just think Trump is running more like we ran. We saw him in 2016 with the benefit of the relationships he has, again, with the GOP uh, state party chairs and the RNC. He's trying to run as a surgeon and being on the stage. I agree with you that it would be the right thing to do. But I, just, I don't even just mean the right thing. You know, this, this just reminds me of something. And I'm not comparing Trump and Obama. So everybody put down your laptops, put down your, <laughs> your iPhones. But I do remember in 2012, I was a White House correspondent and Obama went like a year or so only really doing generally soft interviews, friendly interviews. And that first debate with Romney, he whiffed. He was bad because he hadn't been with anybody really challenging him. Now, I don't know what it's going to happen when uh, and if Biden and Trump actually ever face off, but I don't think Trump's going to be in fight and shape. It's First of all, let's talk about our top story today. Trump's legal team is appealing the decision by Maine Secretary of State to try to remove him from the state's primary ballot. We've never seen anything like this. Um, of course, we saw, we've also never seen a, a president actually trying to foment uh, a violence at the Capitol to stop the counting of votes. Uh, but what do you make of it? I continue to believe that every time these states take him off the ballot, whether the primary or eventually if he becomes the nominee, try to do it for the general, that it would be appropriate for the Supreme Court to intervene because I don't think that in this case it's good for voters to not have the chance 
to decide that they don't want to have Donald Trump. But I frankly think it would be politically smart for Joe Biden to come out and say, everybody who is on my side, I get it. I've said that what I think he did that day was insurrection, but I'm not afraid of this guy. And I think voters are going to choose me in the end. I think that'd be politically savvy for him. What do you think? I agree with that point. I would love to see him say, I'm not afraid of him. I'm going to take you on. Let's do this. But I do think what's interesting about the main case is remember he was on CNN earlier today. The gentleman who brought the case is a Republican state senator who had voted for Trump, who was so horrified by January 6th that he filed this. He didn't think he should be on the ballot. What's important about that is we are seeing in the polls, we saw in that big New York Times poll, there is increasingly vote, there are increasingly voters, Republican independents, who say a conviction would be a factor that would have them not vote for Trump. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as these cases start, because, it, you know, that met the calendar didn't show the court dates in between all the court dates. Right. We're learning lots of new information every week. I expect that pace is going to kick up here in January. And we don't know what impact that may have on general election voters in the way that we're seeing, though, in the primary. You know, Trump is obviously doing quite well. Joining us now is the Maryland Congressman and member of the January 6th Committee, Jamie Raskin. He's a congressman from Maryland. Uh, congressman, good to see you. Thank you for being with us. Great to be with you, Ali. Congressman, what do you make of, of, of all of the posturing by Donald Trump about immunity? He makes sort of two separate cases. One is that he's immune from anything he did while he was president, which would tackle a couple of the cases he's involved in. It wouldn't, it wouldn't deal with everything. But the other is that uh, with respect to the election, he was tried by Congress um, and he was not convicted by the Senate. Uh, you'll recall after Donald Trump's uh, acquittal by the Senate, Mitch McConnell himself said this is a matter for the courts to handle. Apparently not for Donald Trump. Yeah, well, on the first point, um, immunity from prosecution for crimes committed during the course of your presidency would be a standing invitation to do what Donald Trump did to try to overthrow the government, because you could never be prosecuted for trying to do that. So Trump would be setting the template for people getting into office and then doing whatever they could, lie, cheat and steal in order to convert our di constitutional democracy into a dictatorship. So it's ridiculous and it's directly contradicted by the language of the Constitution, which says that the president can be prosecuted later, even if he's impeached for office, he is still subject to prosecution and trial and punishment, Article 1, Section 3, Clause 7. But even beyond that stuff, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, what you're raising there, they're running around saying, well, um, he should be able to take office again, despite Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Um, why? Because it would be undemocratic to exclude him from the ballot. But of course, that was a decision made when the Constitution was amended in 1868. That's an argument that's more than a century too late. If they want to amend the Constitution now, they mm -hmm. should go ahead and change the Constitution. They need a two thirds vote in the House and the Senate and three quarters of the states. Um, but in any event, I would say, you know, there, there are different ways that people are disqualified for running from president. There's 75 million people, uh, Americans who can't run because of age restrictions. Mm -hmm. You've got to be 35 years old. OK, there are 25 million people who can't run because they're American citizens, but they were born abroad. These are kind of morally arbitrary distinctions, but they keep at least 100 million people from being eligible for president in this election. Donald Trump is in a class of maybe a dozen people who essentially have disqualified themselves under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment because they engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the democracy. So I would say that this is a pro-democratic provision that fortifies and strengthens democracy. In and this is what uh, a number of the proponents of, of that argument say, that this is actually meant to protect democracy. Uh, one of the arguments that Donald Trump supporters in this make is that it hasn't been determined. It hasn't been determined legally that he was involved in an insurrection. I, I would argue that the, the Colorado uh, Supreme Court really looked into this. They really, really studied all the ways you could uh, interpret a rebellion and all the things that Donald Trump did, much of which um, you saw uh, as, a, as a member of the January 6th committee. We all saw uh, they they said that's not the part that's in question, really. 
Well, it was a painstaking factual analysis that the Colorado court engaged in, and they also defined an insurrection, according to original sources, as something more than a riot, but less than a full-blown revolution. An insurrection is a riot, essentially, that has a political purpose. And of course, that riot had a very specific political purpose, which was to block the peaceful transfer of power under the Constitution and to get Donald Trump in. I mean, imagine if Vice President Pence had said, you know what, you guys win. I'm buckling under and I'm going to simply declare that Donald Trump is one. I'm going to reject electoral college votes from Arizona, from Pennsylvania and Georgia. Does anybody in his or her right mind think that Donald Trump would have said, no, 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 no. I was just kidding. The way you really do this under the 12th Amendment, under the Constitution, is you count all the electoral college votes. And, uh, you know, I was just kidding about all that stuff. Of course not. He would have taken the office. He would have proceeded to impose martial law as as Michael Flynn had been urging him to do. And we would be living under a completely different form of government right now. So if we listen to the wisdom of the founders, if we follow the literal text of the Constitution, Donald Trump simply can't be president again. There are tens of millions of other people in the country who can be, but he has disqualified himself under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment by trying to overthrow the constitutional order. What do you make of the discussion that's been getting a lot of ink these days by people who are not constitutional experts uh, about whether it would be more satisfying or less satisfying to have Donald Trump disqualified versus defeated at the polls? I mean, it's an irrelevant question, legally speaking. I mean, at this point, we should be focused on who is qualified to run and who's not qualified to run. Section three of the 14th Amendment is not some kind of aberrational, eccentric provision in the Constitution. I count more than a half dozen different provisions in the Constitution that specifically target insurrectionary activity. So this before, but as a fresh round of it, and you can see just one right here, but the other ones I have to show you are even more hilarious. So whether it's outside of his window, or whether it's on his TV screen that he watches 12 hours a day, plus he can't hide from the fact that everyone thinks he's a doofus. Watch this, and then I got way more billboards to show you. The last one, you won't believe. So you can see this, right? It really does demonstrate that he it's just not working for him. And like no one believe, like no one buys this argument. Like, look, whether ultimately or not, at the end of the day, he's on the ballots in all states, none of the states, a mixture of some but not others. The point is, is like this idea that it's a witch hunt against Trump is absurd. The reason we're even having a debate is because he did something so egregious. Like, look, we've had arguments about evil presidents, mostly Republicans, over recent years. But none of them have done a coup or attempted a coup on their own country. Other countries, you know, the, there's a shady history there, but like in their own country. And so the reality is like there's never really been a debate about whether a, 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 a sitting president or prospective president, Republican or Democrat in modern history actually belongs in the race or not. Whether or not they're evil or whether or not they should win, they all were eligible the only reason we're having this discussion and notes here is because Trump did something uniquely brazenly awful. And that's why this 14th Amendment is coming up, right? The, that's why there's a debate because it's so egregious. And so like you could see the, the, the hosts are all, they, they, they can't contain their laughter. And you see Jamie Raskin crushing him as well because the man deserves mockery. You could see these billboards. Right, you see, I had them on the screen while I was talking there. It really demonstrates that they know they could target Trump through a few key ways. One, by pointing out how he's cost the Republican Party a lot of their historical voters and how even people in the cult like Tucker and whatnot don't actually like him. No one likes him.